Today we're going to be looking at the letter of John, the first letter that John wrote in chapter 3 and verses 1 through to 6. We're going to be looking at the great love of God. Let me pray for us before we, we read his word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that we can consider your word today. We do pray, Lord God, that you would speak to us, that you give us the understanding and the appreciation that we need to understand your word, that by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would come and speak, and that we would have open and receptive hearts to receive from you that which you have freely given. And so I ask, Lord, now that you would meet with us during this time, in Jesus' name, amen. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 beginning there says see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him dear friends now we are children of God and and what we will be has not yet been made known but we know that when Christ appears we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Just that far we're going to read. The great love of God deserves our deep contemplation and appreciation. It should capture our understanding and imaginations. Love is sometimes reduced to a, a warm sentimental feeling. Now it is no less than a feeling or devoid of emotion. But the love of God, as we will see today, is so much more than just that. First of all, we must know the nature of love. As it says in John, see what great love, or behold what love. You see, if we had it within our natural capacities, the ability to know God's love, we would not be told to see or behold it. But the truth is, we don't have it within ourselves. We don't understand or appreciate such great spiritual realities that exist. As 1 John 2.11 says, No one who knows the thoughts of God, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. In verse 13, this is what we speak. Words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person with the Spirit, that is the believer, the child of God, we have the mind of Christ. Our flesh will cause us to substitute the love of God with other lesser loves. We go after acceptance and affirmation from people in all the wrong ways, which just leaves you rejected and with all kinds of rejection issues and insecurities and hang-ups. Our flesh will diminish the love of God to lesser things, to things like material prosperity, we associate that with love. When all is well, well, then things are going well for us. And when we have many things, well, that's because God loves us. Or that God is somehow pleased with you. If you're on that understanding, it is a roller coaster ride. Or perhaps people sometimes think that love is feeling loved. But our feelings are unreliable and emotions cannot always be trusted. God's love is so much more than this. Our flesh will ultimately distort the love of God into something else that it is not. Into something lesser or into something that is other. It is important that we recognize that not all people know and appreciate this love of God. Some have never heard of it. And hence we have the, know the importance of the church's missions work that we do. The love of God is fuel that motivates and drives our mission engine and all our mission efforts. If we don't think that missions is important, we really don't understand God's love. 
nor do we love the lost to whom his love is directed. It is true that even some Christians don't even know the love of God. They quench the Holy Spirit and put out its fire. Perhaps by allowing and, and dwelling on your past, you keep yourself from experiencing the fullest love of God now. Perhaps you just it's just because you never really understood what this love of God really is. I hope our reading this today is, is will help you to appreciate what we have and you won't simply rely on your own limited understanding. And this is why the church is an active agency in discipleship to make disciples of all people. That is to push back unbelief and ignorance of the facts so that believers believe what they have in Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he was speaking to a very religious man, a very uninformed religious believer, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, Jesus said to him in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. By saying this, Jesus defines the great and most perfect, excellent love of God for all men. Kind. This is, of course, perfect agape love. It is real. It is tangible. It is sacrificial. Romans 5 verse 8 puts it like this. It says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God's love has been demonstrated to us through his son, Jesus Christ, by sending his son to die for us. Now, we must see it and we must behold and understand it for ourselves. We need to get it. Because in our natural selves, we don't just see and get it. It has to be contemplated by us. Pride and unbelief gets in the way of appreciating the free, undeserved love of God. So not only do we need to know the nature of this love, that is the sacrificial, perfect love of God, we also see in our passage the origin and the destination of the love of God. It says, the Father has lavished his love on us. Love comes from God. God is perfect. So this is perfect love. Even when we love it, it's only because God has put his love into our hearts. <coughs> our love is limited. It is imperfect. But because the love of God is in our hearts, it is made perfect through Christ by His Holy Spirit who enables us to love and enables us to know the love of God. You see, the Father is the source of all love. And you are the destination, you are the point of contact for His love. Romans 5.5 5 says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The love of God literally, as it says, has been lavished on you in the most spectacular fashion. That is, both in terms of extent, the, the extent to which God has lavished upon His love upon us. Uh, it has come not in some meager, a small fashion, but it is abundantly sufficient for all our needs. It is this idea of overflowing love. And it is lavished in the way that it is given to us. God has willingly given us his love. Not under duress, not unwillingly, but freely, not reluctantly or in some cold manner. It is also generously given. So it is not it, it is one-sided love, really. In other words, God is the one who has given us his love, not because we loved him first. It is not a repayment for something good that we have done. It's not earned. God's love is undeserved. It is a sheer act of God's grace. The third thing that we see in our passage is that the love of God is not without effect. It is not simply a nice idea, but it doesn't actually do anything. It is through the love of God that we are called children of God. Both in name and in actual nature, we are children of God. You are a child of God with the full rights of a son as an heir to the kingdom of God. 
And certainly this is what we are, as our passage reminds us. You are a child of the living God as a believer. It is the Holy Spirit who confirms this in us, as Romans 8.16 says. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. This is complete. It is guaranteed by the blood of Jesus Christ that seals the covenant contract. Now who would not want such a thing? Who would not want to be loved like this? Well, the evidence points to the fact that there are many who reject the love of God, as seen by the world's rejection of God's people and their lack of tolerance and acceptance of God's people. They, don't, they did not know Christ and therefore they do not know us. The love of God is available to all the world, as it says in John 3, 16. So God so loved the world. But that doesn't mean that it is received by all. It's not the same as saying all are saved or all are children of God. It's only those who believe in Jesus Christ and receive the love of God who are children of God in the sense that John means it here. All people are made in the image of God and in that generic sense are children of God. But they have no rights. They are not heirs to the kingdom of God. We become sons and children of God with full rights as heirs to the kingdom of God when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Being a child of a parent uh, and, and when, when, when they die does not guarantee, doesn't mean that you automatically take ownership of that inheritance. You have to be included in the world and you have to receive it and accept that what has been given to you is yours. You see, you can refuse and you can reject the offer and not receive it. But one, John, uh, the, the, the book of John chapter 1 verse 12 says, All who did receive him, that is Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God and born of God. There is an element of mystery in the love of God. Verse 2 says, we know we are children of God now, but what we will be has not yet been made known. Now, anything said about this, uh, what we will be, is, is pure speculation. It is a, it is a surprise. There is, there is mystery in that. What we will become. John is talking about when we die and go to be with our Lord. What that, the nature of who we will be then remains somewhat a mystery. We know certain things. But we don't know everything there is. There is a surprise to look forward to that we can only imagine what it will be like. But that which we do know and that which we are certain of, that his love and, 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 and the fact that Jesus is returning, that when he appears that we will be like him and see him as he is. This we know for certain. 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve says, now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see him face to face. Now I know in part, then shall I know fully, even as I am fully known. So what should our response be to the love of God? Is it just a nice warm feeling? How do we react to this great love of God? How do we respond to this? Well, we must live a life of love for God. And we do this by doing his will. As verse 3 says, All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. How do you prove your love for someone? Well, it's, is it enough just to say I love you? Well, certainly not. You can say I love you, but not show it in any way. And actually you can even just say to somebody you love them when you don't even really care for them at all. So it can't just be with words. Yet there are so many who say that they believe in God, that they love Him, and yet they do nothing to show their love for God. Some even go so far as to disprove their love by doing what they know God does not want them to do, by living in sin and being God's lawbreaker, which is contrary to the love of God. You know the whole purpose of Jesus' coming was, as it says in verse 5, that he might take away our sins. 
So now for you to continue in sin smacks in the face of everything Jesus has done for you and makes a mockery of the great love of God. In God is no sin. So a love for sin shows a lack of love for God. It's that simple. If you keep on sinning deliberately, you do not know God. Your salvation is not real. You've never really seen or known Him personally. And you need to come right with God. Perfection will only be a reality with Christ in glory one day, when we will be what we will be, living in total sinlessness. John is not saying that if you sin, you're not saved. He's addressing the fake believer who keeps on sinning. He's talking to the hypocrite, a person who is deliberate and unrepentant in their sin. Repentance and faith involves a shift in our attitude and behavior towards Jesus Christ. We should be more like Jesus every day, though we are not Jesus and perfect in every way. If this progress is lacking, there is something seriously wrong with anyone who claims to be a Christian and yet they continue to willfully continue in their sin. And they discredit the wonderful salvation that we have and they ultimately discredit our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. Now, in our struggle with sin, we can become discouraged with our slow progress. We might question our salvation and be, be, be even tempted to, to give up trying, thinking that perfection is really our hopeless goal. Until we remember that when Jesus returns, we will be like him. This is written in the future tense, that our struggle will be over even though not right now. There is a wrestling and a struggling that takes place in every believer. It doesn't mean that you're not a believer. It's just the reality of living in our sinful flesh. Until we purify ourselves, we humbly confess and repent our sins, which is an ongoing activity. Christ purges us of all that which we have done that is wrong. Jesus came to take away our sins to deal with our sins, and in this is our hope, so that we are not overcome with discouragement or overwhelmed by failure, but fully reliant on His amazing grace in us. We have this hope in Him, and it is our only hope that we have. As John Stott writes and says, the first step towards holy living is to recognize the true nature and wickedness of our sin. When we recognize that, when we call our sin for what it is and nothing less, then we begin a healing process, a process of progress where we move away from sin and move towards Christ. Sometimes when we have sinned, we will say things like, I've made a mistake, or I had a lapse of judgment, or I'm finding it difficult at the moment. We need to call our sin for what it is. It is sin. It is lawlessness. Don't make any excuses for it. Don't blame your past for your sin. And don't blame others for your sin. Take ownership and be responsible for those things that you are doing that you know are not right with God. It's only then when you humbly recognize your sinfulness and your need for a Savior as adequate and as willing as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is willing and able to forgive you of your sins, it's only then that you will see the progress that you need in your spiritual life. When we call sin for what it is, you will find the cure for your sin in Jesus Christ alone. If you make your sin something lesser, you'll make it as if something it's something that you can deal with. It's something that you can cure yourself with. And you're ultimately left with the notion, the, fa the false notion, that you can deal with your sin without a Savior, which you cannot. You have, though, a Savior in Jesus Christ that can cleanse you. And Jesus can do His work in you when you humbly confess your sins to Him and repent of it purifying yourself of all unrighteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ so that you can live in him and not in sin 
that you can choose life in Jesus Christ and move away from the death of sin. Live life in the great love of God as a child of God. Don't live and choose to live in death and in sin and in all the darkness that that brings. Jesus Christ is a loving Savior who can and will forgive you of all your sins if you will confess Him to Him today. If you will turn to Him today, you will find a loving Savior who will never leave you, never forsake you, and He will never reject you no matter what you have done. But if you choose to neglect, if you choose to, to somehow ignore, choose to deny that you have sin in your life, that you don't really need to deal with, you deny the wonderful salvation that has come through the love of God to every sinner, even the worst of sinners. As I always say, you're never too good to need salvation, and you're never too bad to be out of reach of salvation. Jesus Christ is sufficient to save, and if you've never confessed your sins to Him, you need to give your life to Him by repenting of your sin and turning to Jesus Christ and accepting Him as your Lord and Savior. If you are a believer, and if you have prayed prayers in the past where you accept Him as your Savior, but you have found that you have lost your way, that you have fallen into sin and lawlessness again, confess your sins today, return to the cross of Jesus Christ, that He can forgive your sins, that He can cleanse you of all unrighteousness, and that He can save you to serve Him. I hope that this word is a challenge to you, I hope that this word makes you feel unsettled in your sin and that it brings you to a place where you can receive Jesus Christ and the full love of God that is available to all who will believe that you can make right with him through today through his son, Jesus Christ, who has died for you. Be blessed as you remember what God has done for you. Be blessed as you receive the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be blessed as you come to know the love of God and see it for what it really is. May God be with you. Let me pray for you as we close off this message. Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for your great love, Lord, for us. We thank you, Lord, that, that we are the beneficiaries, Lord. We are the recipients of this amazing love. Now, Lord, we do confess today how we need your salvation, how we need your forgiveness. And we thank and praise you, Lord, for what you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ, for us. And so, Lord, I pray for anyone listening to this message, Lord, who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord God, that you give them the faith right now to turn from their empty way of life, to turn from their sin, to stop thinking that they are okay, and living in the false security of their own good works, and rather turn to you to be saved. I pray for every believer who has grown cold, every believer who has, who has turned away from the living God, back to worthless idols, back to worthless things, to their former way of life, that Lord God, today you would give them no peace, that you would stop them in their tracks, and that you would bring them back to their senses, that they will repent of their sin today, and again, trust in you for the full forgiveness and for the full redemption and purification of their sins. For we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and be with you. May he watch over you. May his face shine upon you. May he give you his peace. And may he watch over you the rest of this day. God bless you.